you chose to spend your time with me. And I, I really, really appreciate um, you doing that. Um, this is kind of an introduction to all of you of sort of what has Linfield been doing for the last four months. So since we had to go remote, this is kind of a, a sort of a, a taste of what it's been like teaching in this environment. So hopefully you'll kind of get to, to see um, how we've been doing our best to kind of keep that Linfield experience even when we can't necessarily share a classroom with everybody. Um, and I'd like to say thanks to, to Kaylee and Joni for uh, indulging me, let me do this because it's really something I wanted to do. Um, as you can tell, I'm speaking to you from lovely downtown Day Hall. Uh, normally we would have done this from uh, Lucky Lab in downtown Portland, but that's not really an option right now. So we're gonna do it this way. Uh, I am being virtuous. Normally, if we'd been at Lucky Lab, I'd be having a beer, but instead I'm instead having a Hawaiian sun uh, in my lovely McMinnville Meltdown glass. Uh, just so you guys know, McMinnville Meltdown is a, a fundraiser for YCAP, which is a local um, civic action program. It's a local food bank. Um, so, yep. Uh, so just kind of represent there. So if you let me just get that ready, then we can start talking. Now, this is we're, we're going to be talking about um, the movie Greyhound and kind of more specifically about the Battle of the Atlantic, which is sort of the, the process of getting men, ships, and equipment across the Atlantic to support Great Britain during World War II. Um, and when we talk about this, it's... Um, I, I love this. I was, I was so happy when I saw that they're going to be making a movie on this because it's it's taken from a C.S. Forrester novel um, named The Good Shepherd. And C.S. Forrester is probably not one of those names that a lot of you kind of you know, just jumps out and gets you. But C.S. Forrester wrote um, all the Horatio Hornblower novels. He wrote The African Queen, uh, wrote a whole bunch of screenplays for movies that you might recognize from the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, very prolific writer but he really just writes a good sea chase. He writes a good, fun, um, basically maritime novel. And it's one that I, I really enjoy them. I really recommend you, that you read them. The, the movie is great, it's fantastic, but the, the book, you get the chance to kind of get the inner monologue that goes with it. Um, and it matters a lot to me personally because when I was growing up, um, my, my mom and dad, my mom had this like, extraordinary chicken coop that, that took multiple years to build. And my dad and I worked on it for some time. And what I would do is I come home from school and I'd work on this chicken coop uh, with my dad. For the record, this chicken coop had electricity, running water and a skylight. Okay, so this chicken coop was like nicer than my first apartment. So it took us a while to build it. But as my dad were working, my dad were working on it, we would talk through everything and he would talk about books that he loved and books that he, he enjoyed growing up. And he recommended things to me to go read. And one of them was, in fact, all the C.S. Forrester novels. So, so at a very personal level, this, this means a lot to me because I, I connect it with my dad. Um, so just kind of share that one. So what I'm going to announce, I'm going to start firing up the, the um, PowerPoint. So we can start talking through that. And I'll kind of drop in and out of that as we go through. If you have questions or if there's something that um, you wanted to say, just um, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, I think you, you should be able to all see that. I can't see people, so I don't know. It's a little different than when I teach, but so let me start the share screen here. Get this going. Okay. All right. And sorry if I see you. There's always a bit of a, an adventure when you do this. So you never know quite what's going on. So, yeah, welcome to talking about Greyhound, Economic Warfare in World War II. I'm Eric, um, which most of you know. <laughs> now, when we talk about this, and you'll see this picture here, right here. We'll come back to this in a bit, but you'll notice that's Linfield Victory. That is SS Linfield Victory. She's important. We'll talk about her later. But that is a ship, and the name is not an accident. Um, and so when we talk about Greyhound, it just came out on... Uh, Apple TV last week. It is a movie adaptation of C.S. Forrester's The Good Shepherd. I really would recommend that you, if you get the chance, read the novel. It's great. Um, but when you start looking at the novel, when you, um, when you read it, one of the very beginning is that literally from the, the beginning of chapter two, it starts out and there's this 
passage in the beginning of the book that I kind of like to read to everybody so you kind of know this is that as Commander Krauss, who's the, the skipper of USS Keeling, which is the, the ship at the center of the, the novel, is looking over the convoy he's expected to get across the Atlantic, he starts sizing up all the ships. And he talks about that back in the center of the convoy was the tanker Hendrickson. It was no importance that in the books of the company that owned her, she was valued a quarter of a million dollars and the oil that she carried at another quarter of a million. That meant literally nothing. But the fact that if she should arrive in England, her cargo would provide an hour's steaming for the entire British Navy meant something too important to be measured at all. What money price can be put on an hour's freedom for the world? The thirsty man of the desert pays no heeds to his pocket full of banknotes. Yet the fact that Commander Krauss tipped the scale at 150 pounds could be of official importance. It all mattered in the measure of victory. And that's what we're talking about here is we're talking about this, this idea that getting this stuff across the Atlantic, that's what matters. Um, this is very much a production battle. It's how do you get stuff from the United States across the Atlantic to Great Britain so that you can translate production into power? How do you translate what we make into the ability to influence events and to ultimately defeat the Nazis? Because we're all about defeating Nazis. Defeating Nazis is a good thing, okay? Um, so we talk about that as, you know, how do you translate that production into power? And how do you do that through your supply chains? How do you get it so that what you make actually translates into something that you can use? And it ultimately is going to boil down to this battle of what we call difference equations. It's a battle of how do things change through time as far as how much stuff do I have now and how much stuff do I have later versus how much stuff does the other guy have now versus how much the other guy, stuff the other guy has later. So we'll run through some math. I promise you, and I know Kit, Crane is out there somewhere. There's not much math, I promise. I, I, I tried my very best to keep all the math out of it. Um, so we'll talk about those difference equations. We'll talk about why convoys work. Um, for those of you who maybe have seen the movie, you know that he's getting a convoy across the ocean. Did you ever wonder why they do that? There's a really good economic reason for why you get all of your ships in one place and you take them together um, across. It's, it's like kindergarten. You know, don't lose track of your buddy. Get everybody from one place to another. So we talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about the strategic picture that is sort of what is the environment that the, the movie takes place in and why are they doing what they're doing. And then we'll talk about the, you know, the, the Battle of the Atlantic One. What is it that actually turned the tide? Because obviously we beat the Nazis. Um, so how do we go from the situations described in the movie to, to where we defeat the Nazis? I'm going to tell a secret that SS Linfield victory, it matters. Okay. So that's where we're going. And like I said, if you have things you want to pop up with a, a question or toss something out there in the chat, go right ahead. Um, so here's our basic supply problem. And I know I said there's going to be like no math, but I do have to have a graph. I'm, I'm an economist. It's got to be there. Um, and when you talk about sort of a, a peacetime environment, what we think about is that I've got demand, I've got supply. And when you talk about sort of the, the peacetime demand in Britain, what you've got is this, this outer demand curve, this kind of slate blue one right here. And that's your total demand. That's all of your demand. That's what people want to buy. Now, within that demand, there's a subset of what we call essential demand. And that essential demand is this interior demand curve down here. What you notice is that there's a period of time where the two demand curves are coincident, they're the same. We got some fraction where um, all you have is essential demand, then the price gets low enough, you start seeing that non-essential stuff. So that horizontal distance between those two demand curves, that's gonna measure the, the non-essential demand, the, the nice to haves, not the stuff you have to have, the nice to haves. And you got our good handy dandy supply curve, here this kind of um, olive colored line. And under normal circumstances, you go to where the two, the total demand, the supply curve intersect, and we're gonna get this much stuff sold at kind of this price. That's what happens in peacetime, that's the way things work. We all know that one, we're used to that, we live in peacetime. When you get into a wartime environment, the graph changes, and it changes in a very critical way. The first thing is that that total demand, that goes away, that disappears. The non-essential stuff, it's out the window. It doesn't matter anymore. But that supply curve is gonna change as well. So we start talking about what happens in wartime, if I can get this to go, is that now that demand gets stripped to the bare bones. Okay, the demand, the only demand that exists is the essential demand, the stuff that you have to have. So you notice the demand curve is relatively in, but now compared to what we had before, we got two supply curves. 
We have two supply curves, and the two supply curves are to reflect the fact that the enemy gets a vote. Just because we send stuff across the ocean doesn't mean it actually gets there. So we're going to have two supply curves. We're going to have basically this yellow supply curve, which is the supply curve where we send, and this kind of haze gray demand uh, supply curve, haze gray supply curve, that is what we call effective supply. That's the amount that actually gets there. So that horizontal distance between these two supply curves at any given point, this is how much we have to send to get this much actually showing up in England. And the reason there's that gap is because the Germans are out there doing their level best to sync things. So the, the divergence between those two supply curves is how we represent the impacts of German combat actions. And we start talking about it that, you know, here we get an equilibrium. We're going to have a, a, a price quantity combination that we see out of this. But what matters in England is the amount that actually gets there. So there's their effective supply. What they actually get to make their decisions off of is this gray one. But we have to send, so we're going to, in this case, it's about, and I've got this measured in monthly tons is how it's actually measured. You know, we have to send about 220 tons to get there. But to pull that off, you have to ship almost 400. And that difference, that gap, between how much you receive versus how much you send, that's the effect of combat. And we can measure it two ways. Uh, we can see the increase in the cost in terms of the dollars. Um, we can see that the increase in cost in terms of the dollars here in the vertical space, and we can also see that horizontal space in terms of the quantity. So if you wanna think in your head that what you got going on here is that there's this increase in dollar cost and an increase in physical cost. There's an increase in cost of how much it costs us to get there, but there's also this increase in cost of how much stuff do I have to send extra. What we want to do, because we don't like Nazis, is we want to get those two supply curves as close as possible. And that's really, when you talk about those convoys, that's what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to get it so that what the Germans are doing is not having an effect, and those two supply curves are getting as close together as possible, trying to get back to a peacetime circumstance. Now, the other thing about this is that... Um, this is a is what we call a repeated game okay so that that supply and demand curve we're talking about that that's something that happens once it happens in a single month but guess what it happens again next month so we're gonna have to go do this over and over and over again so think of this as sort of like you're gonna have this supply demand problem every single month of the war as long as you go um so it's a repeated and dynamic game you get to do this over and over again and it's dynamic in the sense that how you do in one period is going to influence how you do the next period. So the, in the movie, they're talking about a convoy very early in the war. It's February of 1942. How you do in February 1942 has implications for how you can do in March of 42. And how you do in March depends on, you know, determines how you do in April. So there's this, this connection through time that it's not just how you do today. It's how you did yesterday that influences what you can do. And it's also what I do today has implications for tomorrow. Um, the other thing about it is that this is a, is a very different, the, the, what this means to, to the allies, the, the US, Canada, Great Britain, and what it means to Germany are very, very different. For the allies, this is a, a battle you can't lose. You, you simply cannot lose this. If you lose this, Great Britain is out of the game. They, they cannot, they, they become a non-combatant effectively. Um, so it's, it's a, a battle that can't be lost. Having said that, success in this doesn't mean that you necessarily win. Um, you still have to amass combat power in Great Britain and then project that into to Europe, who we'll ultimately see in D-Day. Um, so on the Allied side, it's a battle that can't be lost. On the other hand, for the Nazis, if they can win this, they knock Great Britain out of the war and they win. So there's a mismatch in terms of what this means for the people doing it. On the one side, allies can't lose it, um, but winning it, it isn't going to win the war for you. Whereas the, the, the Germans, the, the Nazis, this is a way for them to win. Okay. All right. So keep that in mind when you start thinking about sort of the, the implications of this. Now, along with that is this other part of it that um, what, what makes the United Kingdom so vulnerable is that they're an island, okay? That, that should be self-evident. They're an island. They're also a really import-dependent island. 
So when you talk about before the start of the war, pre-1939, um, about 70% of their food is imported. About 40% of all the stuff that, that Great Britain uses total is imported before the war. And we start getting into very specific categories, things like oil, uh, it's about 100%. So they're really, really import dependent. Their economy depends on a steady flow of imports into the United Kingdom, particularly food and oil. So those are really important that we, we get those across from the, the United States. Um, and it boils down to kind of how we can do on three different equations. The three equations to pay attention to are our cargo ships, our escort vessels, that's that destroyer that the Cap, uh, Commander Krauss is commanding in the movie, and the U-boats, that's the, the German submarines, the bad guys. So we talk about that the cargo ships, the CT plus one, the number of cargo ships you have in the next time period is gonna depend on how many cargo ships do you have in the present time period, CT, plus your new construction, minus how many get sunk. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so how much I got next month, depends on how much I had this month, plus how many I build, minus how many get sent to the bottom of the ocean. You have the same type of equation for your escort vessels, for your destroyers. How many destroyers have a next month, depends on how many I started out with, plus how many I build, minus how many get sunk. And the same thing for the U-boats. How many U-boats the Germans have next month, depends on how many I started with, plus how many they build, minus how many we sink. Now, the intersection of those three equations is gonna determine how we succeed. Um, for the Allies, obviously what you wanna do is ideally you have more cargo ships next month than you did this month. So that happens only if we can keep this part of it, the new construction minus the sinkings. If I can keep the new construction greater than the sinkings, I'm doing okay. Same thing for the escorts. I wanna keep this number going up as well as it improves my ability to protect these guys. This is what matters is how I'm doing is in that cargo. It also means that I need to keep the Germans so that this number, the number of U-boats they have next period, that that is less than what they started with. So what I wanna do is for me to win, for the allies to win, these two first equations, those have to go up. And this last equation, the Germans, that has to go down. So what I wanna do is I wanna to get to a situation where I've got my cargo ships going up, my escorts going up, and their U-boats are going down. And what happens is as I make their U-boats go down, those two supply curves start getting closer and closer together. Um, and so the winning strategy for the, the allies is you want these two things going up and that one going down. Now, for those of you who like a, a pretty picture, what's going on with that is that, think of it as sort of like if those cargo ships are steady, so if your build and your loss rates are even, you can have that line. And if your build rate is greater than the sinking rate, you're gonna see an increase through time. And if the sink rate is greater than build rate, you're gonna see this one. This is treading water, that's winning, that's losing. And what we wanna avoid this one. That's the, that bottom one, that's what, no, that bottom one, you guys can't see what I'm doing, is I'm, that bottom one, that's what we want to avoid. That's bad. That's treading water. That's winning. That's bad. Okay. So that's what's happening with those, those difference equations through time. And specifically what we see is we want to get as much cargo across as we can. Okay. We want to get as close to a peacetime situation as is possible. So within our three equations, we want to sit back and talk about, well, what is it I control? What is it I can actually manage? You know, what is, you know, how am I going to find success? What am I going to call? So we see is that I want to maximize the number, well, I want to maximize the number of, of ships that get across the ocean. I want to get as much stuff to, to Great Britain as I can, which means that the way that I maximize that stuff is I make sure that I minimize the number of sinkings. And hopefully that should make sense. It's like if I, you know, minimize the sinkings, then I maximize the stuff that gets across. So my measure for success on the cargo side is we look at that sinking number. How am I doing there? Okay, if I can get that number as small as possible, ideally to zero, I'm doing great. The thing I control, the thing I can manage is I can protect those cargo ships through my number of escorts. So my objective is to maximize the number of cargo ships that gets across successfully. My control, the thing that I manage is the number of escorts I apply to the problem. And what 
the way I do that, the way that I, that I achieve that outcome is by sinking U-boats, okay? So if you wanna think about it as sort of my objective is minimize sinkings through how many escorts I apply to maximize the number of U-boats I sink. Making sense? Um, and it just happens that that's kind of what they did, is that they, they wanted to come up with this kind of quick and dirty way to, to measure this. And what the operations research group at the Department of the Navy, which is a group of, of mathematicians and economists and physicists, um, figure out, well, how do we actually measure this stuff? What they came up with was that the easiest way to manage this, the easiest way to tell whether or not they're being successful at accomplishing that goal is to, to look at what we call the exchange ratio. Um, so they came up with a ratio of sunk U-boats to sunk cargo ships. And if you think about it, if you maximize that exchange ratio, the bigger the numerator is and the smaller that denominator is, the better you're doing. Um, and that's, that's what they used. Now, that was actually the, the, their critical measure of success. And it's actually kind of funny because the, um, the Navy developed a textbook for that. Uh, this is the actual textbook. It's called Methods of Operations Research. Um, it was originally published in 1948. It was originally classified. Um, it, it basically took everything the Navy did during World War II and put it in textbook. Uh, it was declassified in 1952, which is why I have it. But they actually did this. I mean, they actually did all the math to figure out how to manage this. It's how they decided, well, I'm going to maximize the number of sinkings, minimize, uh, maximize sinking of U-boats, minimize the number of, of cargo ships I use, I lose, and I'm going to do that by how do I assign my escorts to these problems. Kind of cool. Um, sort of interesting application of math. And what it boils down to is that your sinking of U-boats then basically is a production function. Your sinking of U-boats is that's my output. That's what my, I'm producing. And I'm going to produce those sunk U-boats by the number of escorts that I apply to each um, convoy. Now, there's some other things that go with that, and that is that how productive my escorts are at sinking U-boats depends on some things that I don't necessarily control, but they're important to me. And this is stuff like the technology that I use. Um, so how good is my sonar? How good is my radar? Um, does that make it easier or harder to find those U-boats? How good is my intelligence? Um, we were able to eventually break the Germans' codes, and when you can do that, you kind of know where they're hanging out. Um, so that makes you more productive at sinking your boats. And then lastly, there's some complementary inputs. There's some other things that go alongside those uh, escorts that make those escorts more productive. For example, aircraft. The whole point of the, the movie, if you've had a chance to see it, is that they're trying to get across. Uh, in, the, in the movie, they call it the, the black pit. Um, it's, it's also known, it's referred to sometimes as the black gap, the black pit sometimes. Um, it's in the official Navy reference, it's the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Air Gap, because that's the way we talk about those things. But it's that area where there's no, there's no air cover, um, so the submarines can kind of do their thing on the, day in, um, on the surface in the daytime. Um, when you get aircraft added into that's a complementary input that makes it that much easier to sink them. So think of that as kind of a complementary input. Now, as a measure, that ratio of sunk U-boats to sunk cargo ships, um, it's, a, it's a very convenient measure. It's really simple to interpret. It's got a couple of things that you got to be aware of. Um, it does treat a sunk U-boat as a sunk U-boat as a sunk U-boat. So it treats all sunk U-boats as being of equal value. More critically, it treats all sunk cargo ships as being of equal value. Now, that's not really the case. Some cargo ships are more important than other cargo ships. So this just deals in raw numbers. It's fast, it's easy, but it's not always the, the, the most precise number. But we're willing to, to kind of work with that because it's faster to get to that and it's close enough. It's, it's the good enough answer. Um, so it's not perfect, but it, it does the job. And it is literally what they used through the, the entire war when they talked about how do you assign escorts, how do you actually manage this, this is the number they track. Um, so when you start talking about it and you go through and you take those, those difference equations, you do a whole bunch of math that I'm not going to show you um, because I'm nice. <laughs> if, if you took like Econ 361, uh, some of you may have taken that from me. You know, we, we do some of this and I run through the math and part of it, but um, I'm not showing you guys this. 
what you get is you get this handy dandy graph and you get this kind of inverted U shape. That inverted U shape is the, the relative build rate of U boats. So how many U boats can the Germans absorb losing? How many can they afford to lose relative to their construction rate based on the number of total U-boats they have in operation? What you see is that um, that inverted U kind of goes up. Basically, if you think about it, they can, they can handle, they can lose more U-boats if they have more U-boats, right? That makes sense. And then as they have a lot of U-boats, they don't need to build as many because they've already got a lot of U-boats, so it starts coming down. So over here on this left-hand side of the graph, um, they can absorb greater losses because they're, they're getting more U-boats over here. They don't have to build as many because they've already got a whole bunch. So that's kind of the German side of the graph. The other graph here is this vertical line, and that is the steady state, steady state sink rate. That is the number of U-boats that the Allies have to sink based on a monthly basis to have a desired outcome on the, the, the Germans. And what we see is that when we put those two graphs together, we kind of get these four different sort of outcome quadrants. And they got these arrows lined up. Um, over here, when you're over in this region, what you've got is you're, you're above the Germans' uh, sink build rate, but you're to the right of the, the ally target. So what winds up happening over here is that if you're operating here, you're sinking Germans fat, sinking German U-boats faster than they're building them. So what's going to happen is that it's going to cause the, the number of U-boats to decline, which is why the arrow's pointing left. But also because as you sink U-boats, there's fewer U-boats to sink. It, it has a downward pressure on that side. So we see that that's going to kind of push you there. So gradually, if you're op operating over here, it tends to push you, whoa, hello. Um, it pushes you back to this point here. It pushes you down to the intersection between the two curves. We really don't want to be there because at that point, the number that we're sinking and the number that they're building is equal. So that's a stalemate outcome. So we don't want to wind up up here because it's going to push to stalemate. And like I said, you talk about the Battle of Atlantic, we can't lose. We can't lose. Um, so stalemate's bad. <laughs> you get a similar stalemate outcome over here uh, when you're operating in this kind of region that their build rate is, is above the sinking rate. So they're increasing. So it's going to build to that stalemate over here. That's also, that, that's not helpful for us. Um, over here, what's happening in this region, here you're on the sinking rate for the allies is underneath their construction rate relative to the number of operational U-boats. That's way bad. This area over here, kind of under the graph, that's way bad. Because what's going to wind up happening here is you're just not sinking them fast enough. So what happens is that you see that if you're operating in this region, because you're sinking them faster and slower than they build them, they're going to start getting an increased number of U-boats. So you'll notice that I've got this mapped out so that we've got the three kind of gray arrow sets. This stalemate. That stalemate, that one disaster because you're, you're underneath their build rate and just not sinking fast enough. There's a very narrow path for the allies to achieve victory and it only happens if you're over here. It only happens if you're in an environment where you're sinking them, you're sinking them faster than they're building. So this area here, this area here, that spot, that's where you got to be to win, okay? So for the Allies, you've got to be operating in this region where you're above their build rate and you're sinking them faster than that. Now, the other way you can, you can achieve victory is like, well, what if I can do something that causes this line, that vertical line, that my, you know, how well I'm doing it, sinking them. what if I can move that to the right? If I get better at sinking them, that line moves to the right. So the area where that, that red set of arrows is in effect, that gets bigger. And what we're going to see eventually is that that's kind of what the allies do is that they, they basically start out over here and they get to a point where that becomes, um, they're able to, to get more productive and move that intersection over so that the areas where you either get stalemate or the Germans are winning, it's progressively smaller. Um, now it just so happens that the, 
the, the Germans figured that for them to win, uh, they figured that their estimate was they needed to sink about 50 ships a month uh, for them to, to be successful. Um, they were building about 20 U-boats a month. So if they could keep it so that they're sinking about 50 ships and building 20, that, that's going to be successful for them. So just kind of know that. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the big thing. That's what we're, we're, so what we're looking at is we want to see what's that exchange rate? How are we doing in terms of how many we're sinking compared to how many they're sinking? Uh, we want to make sure that we get to a situation where we're sinking them faster than they can build. We do that, we're doing great. So now we're going to switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about why convoys work. And you know that they, they do. It's like every World War II movie we see, like, oh, we're going to get a convoy across the Atlantic. Why do you do that? Uh, what's the, the, the rationale behind that? What's the, the purpose behind that? And what we see with convoys is that they work at both a strategic and a tactical level. Strategic meaning that the big picture, that's a, it's a war winning approach. And at the tactical level, just that is how do you manage your ships? It's a better choice. This is the way we do it. That's why we do this. And it's going to be that, that using those convoys, what they describe in the movie is the way to get yourself back. If you use convoys, you're going to be eventually getting into this kind of quadrant, that area where you're operating, where you're sinking them faster than they're building. So we're going to talk about, you know, why do convoys work? Why are they effective at maximizing that exchange ratio between you both sunk and cargo lost? And it, it boils down to kind of two things. At the strategic level, it has to do with probabilities. And at the tactical level, it has to do with efficiency. Uh, now, for, for those of you, like, remember your, your economics, anytime I say efficient, the, the giant red, this is cheap, science should be going off in your, your head. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So we'll talk about the strategic side of it. And when you talk about strategically, just so happens that the, the probability of any given U-boat catching a cargo ship going across the Atlantic, it, at the beginning of the war, is about 10%. So if you send a ship across, it's about a 10% chance it's going to run to a U-boat. Um, it, it gets better than that through the course of the war. It eventually gets down to way less than 1%. But it started with about 10%. 10% is the one that that guy. Now, if I send them out alone by themselves, there's a 10% chance that this one could get caught. There's a 10% chance that this one could get caught. There's a 10% chance that this one can get caught. And there's a 10% chance that that one can get caught, okay? What that means then is that the probability to, for me to be successful, all four of them have to get across without getting intercepted, which means that this and this and this and this all have to get across without getting found. Now, and I, I should have done this, I should have like a, a, a survey question for this. Um, for those of you who remember your stats, you know, like remember when Malik talked about like the probabilities with an and, anytime you introduce a, an and into a probability, you multiply. So the probability of getting across, if there's a 10% chance of getting found by a U-boat, there's a 90% chance of not getting found by a U-boat. So the probability of all four of them getting across the Atlantic without getting found is 90% for this one, and 90% chance for this one, and 90% chance for this one, and 90% chance for this one. So the probability of all of them getting across is 0.9, the probability of any one of them getting across, raised to the fourth power, okay? Um, which means there's a 65% chance that all four of them will get across without running into a U-boat, okay? If I send them all together as one, remember I said there's a 10% chance that a U-boat's gonna find them? If I lump them together, that probability, it becomes the same as if it's one ship. So as a strategy, gathering all your ships together and sending them across the Atlantic as a group, rather than sending them across one by one, is the lowest probability of loss strategy. That's why we do it. Um, so strategically, that is the approach that's gonna allow us to minimize those, those losses. Now that's kind of the big picture stuff. At the tactical level, we start talking about, okay, great. Um, how do I actually handle, I've got my ships together. Why do I want to convoy them there? This is where it gets really fun. And this is where the, the movie comes into play. Um, convoys work because they're efficient. Okay? And you know, if, once I've got a convoy in place, what I want to do is I want to minimize the losses, but I also want to use the lowest number of escorts possible. I've only got so many destroyers. I've only, you know, in the movie, they've got 
four, okay? And actually in the book, they're not even destroyers. There's a destroyer, a couple of Corvettes, which is smaller than a destroyer and a, a frigate, which is also small. Um, anyway, so I, I, don't, I don't have very many of them, so I wanna make them go as far as possible. Well, just so happens that by getting everything together, instead of having to have an escort for this one and this one and this one and this one, when I put them together, I don't need as many escorts for all four of them as I do if I have them all scattered apart. Um, it gets even weirder because when you start talking about how many do I need for a bigger convoy, the convoys get bigger than the number of escorts I need. And it has to do with the frontage space. Um, so the actual physical side of the, the, the perimeter of the convoys. So your standard frontage space per ship is about a thousand yards. So each ship is going to have about a thousand yards on this side, about a thousand yards on this side. So you're talking about, you've got four ships, you got a thousand yards, 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 a thousand yards. So your perimeter, your perimeter for a four ship convoy, if each one has a thousand yards, is about 8,000 yards. Okay. And it's the perimeter that matters. Um, oh, we got. Uh, Oh, so Chase is asking me, um, how much easier was it for the Germans to locate the group of cargo ships compared to individual cargo ships? Way easier, way easier. So it's when they're, when they're lumped together as a group, um, instead of having like four needles in the haystack, you got one needle in the haystack. So it was, it was much, much harder for them to find the one group. Oceans are big. So I, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, so... Anyway, um, and so that, that front of space, you get about 8,000 yards for that front of space. When you go to a, a, you know, just we add one ship per, per row and column. So now we go to a nine ship convoy. Well, now my perimeter, my perimeter winds up being instead of 2,000, it's 3,000. So it's 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000. The perimeter goes to 12,000 yards. Um, but I've gone to nine ships. So the, the amount of cargo that I'm carrying, the amount of cargo I'm carrying goes up by about two and a half times because I've gone from four to nine. Um, but the frontage space has only gone up from 8,000 to 12,000. So the, the frontage space has gone up by about 50%. What that means is that the amount of stuff I'm getting across has no more than doubled, but the amount of area I got to protect is only going to buy about 50%. So what happens is that when you start adding destroyers to protect these, a bigger convoy, the average amount of space they got to, got to cover goes down. So it's super efficient. And I can tell you that like right now, what happened is the, the basic way you would do this, it was, you know, the, in the movie, they've got four, uh, four destroyers. That's because basically you've got one on this side, one on this side, one on this side, one on this side. And it's, it's a very efficient way to do it. It's the, the cheapest way to cover them as they go across. So when you start talking about why convoys work, strategically they work because it reduces the probability of interception. Tactically, it works because it reduces the average amount of space that any destroyer has to cover relative to the number of car, amount of cargo getting across. So it's a very efficient way to do it. So, okay, we've talked through some of the economic side of it. Um, oh, hello. Now we're going to talk about the actual. So in the movie, in the movie, they're talking about February of 42. And obviously, you know, the United States gets into the war kind of later than most people. Um, we're, we're, you know, Johnny come lately. Um, we happen to come in and basically the, the, the time when the movie is talking about is not quite the worst time in the war for U-boats, but it's probably, it's like the second worst. Um, when you talk about sort of the strategic picture, from 1939 to 1940, when, when Britain is fighting alone, um, it's, it's manageable. Uh, they, they're struggling. The, the number of U-boats out there are causing fairly high losses, but 1930, 1940, basically, the U-boats the all have to come from Germany 
they have to get out of the Baltic and then into the Atlantic. So they have to go around Denmark um, to get on the Atlantic. So there's this bottleneck. So the, the Brits are basically able to kind of keep them contained there. Uh, so it's manageable. You know, they're all coming from. Um, after 1940, when the, the Germans invade Norway and invade France, suddenly the, the Germans have access to these other bases that are further out in the Atlantic. And it gets really hard for the British uh, because now they've got these problems. They've got these, these German bases that are much further forward and you can't bottleneck them. Um, they get a little bit of stability in 1941 with the U.S. doing what's called the Neutrality Patrol. And the U.S. basically before Pearl Harbor drew a line down the middle of the Atlantic and said, any submarines operating to the left of this line, we're going to treat as an enemy. So what that did for the British was basically it meant that the, the Germans couldn't cross that line. So the, it, it reduced the amount of space that they had to defend. So it was, it was manageable. You can handle it. Okay. It's workable. So they go from, you can block everybody coming out of the Baltic in 1939. 1940 gets complicated because you, you got to cover Norway and France here a bit. Um, 1941 gets a little bit easier because the U.S. goes and says, hey, okay, you only have to play this half of the ocean. Um, the legality of that's a little sketchy, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, and then Pearl Harbor gets attacked, the U.S. enters the war, and bottom line, we're bad. We are really bad. Um, so 1942 is one of the worst times. The, the U-boat situation gets really out of control. Um, to put this in perspective, so the, the time that the movie's talking about, the average loss per month during that time period, remember our, our goal is you want to maximize the number of submarine sinkings relative to the number of ship losses. Um, the average loss per month in 1942 is a little, it's almost 700,000 tons of shipping, which works out to be a about 70, 70 ships per month. So 70 ships per month um, for the entire year. Yeah, it was in 70 ships per month. And during the entire year of 1942, we kind of only sank 70 U-boats. Uh, so the average number of, of ships, of U-boats we're sinking is less than six a month. So we're losing 70. We're sinking six. Um, it's that 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 ratio that that exchange ratio is really bad. It's it's not a winnable situation. Um, the problem with that is that the the reason that's happening is basically because the U.S. is really 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 bad. Um, right after the the war started, like I said, remember this period of time where the the U.S. had basically said, "Hey, Eastern Atlantic, uh, Western Atlantic's off limits. You can't go there." Um, and the Germans couldn't go there when they clear war on us. They don't have to abide by that anymore. So they sent submarines over to the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. Uh, it wasn't a huge number. They only sent about a dozen. And, well, they sent about a dozen, about six operating at any time. But the U.S. Eastern seaboard, particularly Florida, the Carolinas, and around Texas, they, uh, they kind of didn't think we were at war, so they wouldn't take basic precautions. They wouldn't put their ships in convoy they would not turn off the lights of coastal towns so that you could see where the cities were so you could so the germans could go figure out where they were by looking at the city lights um so if you are thinking hey florida you need to get your act together so that the rest of us don't die they have a long tradition of this okay so uh, yeah actually yeah so doug ballard did the happy times for yeah, and actually it's uh, it's what they refer to as the second happy time um this is what's called a uh, Paukenschlag, drumbeat. And the Germans actually, they had an initial happy time right after they got the, the French ports. They were very effective. They, they referred to that as the first happy time. The, the period off uh, from about January of 42 until about May of 42 is what the Germans refer to as the second happy time. And they're, they're sinking tankers left and right off of um, the US coast. For those of you who are divers, you can actually go and dive on a bunch of the wrecks off of Cape Hatteras, uh, if you want to do that, um, it was it was it, it was avoidable. It was basically avoidable. The the U.S. just was not ready. We didn't do the things that that we should have done. We didn't adopt convoys. We didn't darken cities. It was just it's a U.S. ineptitude. That's the period of time that the movie is talking about. Um, 
we eventually got our act together and we did start convoying. We did start um, basically following the, the British playbook. And um, so 1943 starts out kind of rough, but we eventually recovered. And what you see in 1943 is that we lose about 500,000 tons. So um, um, uh, on average about from about 50 ships per month. So the average ships coming down, but we start sinking a lot more U-boats. And in 1943, there's a bit of sea change that happens um, from about January to May where we're losing, you know, 50 to 100 ships per month, and then it stops in about June, and we start getting down to only losing about 10 ships per month. And it's, it's kind of interesting that that sort of happens. So this U.S. in Aptitude 42, we get our act together, 43 crisis, but then we get really good, and we start sinking them a lot faster. Um, and we finally start getting that, that exchange ratio to go in our favor. And then from 44 to 45, it's just that we're off to the races. We shellac them. Um, what makes a big difference for it is the build rates, is that we start getting to the point where we start actually building ships so much faster than the Germans can sink them that they just can't keep pace. Um, and we basically get the, the increase in production of cargo ships and escorts in particular to a point that, this, that the Germans cannot keep pace with it. So those two first equations we're talking about, that really accelerates to a point that they, just, they can't keep up. Um, we also develop some additional types of escorts. So those complementary inputs, those other things you need to do to make the, yourself more productive, we, we introduced some things that made us more productive. Specifically, what we did is we created what we referred to as escort carriers. Uh, these merchant ships converted over to aircraft carriers and built up in Vancouver, by the way. Um, that closed that air gap that is at the center of the movie. Um, and then we also got better at code breaking and signals intelligence. We got better at knowing where the Germans are and what they're doing so that if you know where they are and what they're doing, guess what? You can avoid them. So we got that. And last, uh, the training. We got really good at training. Um, we found that some ships were better at sinking u boats than others. Now, what do you do with that? Well, what we did is we took those ships that are relatively better asked them what they were doing that was different, and then we built curricula around that. So we institutionalized the, the learning of um, you know, which ships were better at this, and then we would teach other ships to do that. Um, so that's something that the Germans never did. They never institutionalized that learning. They would, they would have U-boat captains be relatively more productive, but they wouldn't ever ask them, hey, what are you doing that's different than everybody else? How can you teach that to other people? We did. And the end result is that the average level of productivity of all of our ships became much better as we went through time because we were identifying who was good and using them to teach everyone else um, quite effectively. And, and that, what that does is it basically causes that, that supply curve to start shifting out and down, and it shrinks the gap between the two curves. As so you start getting back to more of a, a peacetime market. It also has that, that steady state sinking line. It shifts that to the right, which is much more productive in terms of how you're sinking ships compared to the German build rates. And eventually, they just, they just cannot keep up. Um, and it gets to the point where late in 43, they just walk away. Um, they just, they, they, in May of 43, we finally get to a point where it's like we've turned the corner, they walk away. They would go back in the Atlantic periodically. Um, and it's disastrous for them. They, they get to a point where it's like they're losing a U-boat. They're building about 20 a day, uh, 20 a month. They're building about 20 a month um, by the end of 43, and they were losing 30 to 40 per month. So you're building 20, you're losing 40, uh, you're going backwards. It eventually gets to a point where they started losing so many that it didn't matter what they were building because they'd already lost the crews and it couldn't, it was irreplaceable. So, um, yeah. yeah. No, no, there's no spoilers. The, the, uh, somebody's asking me if there's spoilers. There's no spoilers. We beat the Nazis. So, um, and basically what happens is that when you start talking about that, um, that, that relationship between the, the cargo, those supply curves, the, the curves start getting closer. And we start building so much that the, the number of ships we apply to the problem gets so high that just it, it 
dwarfs the Germans ability to, to keep up. So it really does boil down to what makes it possible to succeed in this is that productivity gain. Um, and that American productivity is what, what makes the difference. That's what really makes this all possible. And the, the movie doesn't touch on this because it's after what happens in the movie, but that's really what happens. A um, couple of things going on with that. The first is that, you know, we decide to just, we're only gonna build four ships. <laughs> we're gonna have four ships, uh, four basic types, Liberty, later what's called a victory ship, and then T2 and T3 tankers. So we can build four ships, build those constantly. Um, because we're only building four ships, four types, we get really, really good at it. And it comes to a point where we start producing about 50 cargo ships per month, and the Germans are building less than 20 U-boats. Uh, we start sinking them at a rate of 30 to 40 a month, and just that, that exchange ratio just starts ballooning in our favor. Um, and it goes from being, in 1942, it's, we're losing about 10 cargo ships to one U-boat, uh, by the end of the war, it's 0.75 to 1. So we're losing less than one cargo ship for every U-boat we sink. Um, it's, yeah. So the, the, it's that, that massive level of output, just that dwarfing of output by pushing the supply curve so far to the right, just, they can't match it. Um, and we, we, you know, Linfield is immortalized. We actually have, they build so many of them that they start looking around for names and they start naming them after colleges. So there was in June of 1945, SS Linfield Victory. Um, so we have that. Um, and like I said, it's a standard size, a standard ship. It's about 7,000 tons displacement, about 17,000 ton full load. So it actually carries more cargo than the ship weighs. Kind of cool. Uh, they're not fast. They're not fast. They're about 11 knots with an eight knot cruise. This is very slow, but if you got a lot of them, it doesn't matter. Um, they're mostly built by the Kaiser Yards. Uh, there were seven Kaiser shipyards on the West Coast, three in the Pacific Northwest, four in California. The three in the Pacific Northwest were in, two were in Vancouver and one was in Portland. Uh, so the two in Vancouver, if you ever fly to PDX and they see, you can see the slipways on the Northern side of Columbia. And then the, the one in Portland was on Swan Island. Um, they're prefabricated. Uh, they're basically kits. Um, their average cost is about two million bucks. They carry about two million dollars worth of cargo. So basically, they they pay for themselves in a single trip. Um, and by the end of the war, we're producing about ninety percent of all shipping. To put this in context, the U.S. merchant fleet, the number of cargo ships available, is five times greater at the end of the war than it was at the beginning. Um, it's just we we absolutely dwarf the U-boat's ability to to sink them. Um, I'm trying to get to this a bit faster, but um, yeah, so like I said, there's seven, uh, three here in Oregon, Washington. The, the second one ever built was called SS Star of Oregon, kind of cool. Um, how those build rates came down, how we got so productive at that, kind of comes down to, to two things. Uh, one is this idea of learning by doing, and that is that if you repeat a process over and over again, you get really good at it. And it got to a point where like, they were building so many that they just became hyper efficient. It got to a point where they were building three every two days. Um, and basically what happened is you go from building a bunch of them that as you repeat that process, you just get hyper, hyper efficient. The other thing about it is that we start seeing what we call capital deepening. And that is capital deepening is that the amount of tools available to each worker goes up. You know, initially they were built with rivets, then they switched to welding, and then the welding goes to automated welding. So you have this, this kind of early um, mechanical welding device. Um, so basically the, the amount of tools, the automation of the, the production process gets so high that one, the workers themselves have done this a thousand times, they're really good at it. That's that learning by doing. The other part is the amount of tools I've been able to make it really automated, it's really fast. Um, as a stunt, as a stunt, they built one in four days uh, because they just got really good at it. Uh, having said that, when you start getting that fast at things, there are some, some quality problems. Uh, they would occasionally just break. Um, but like I said, they basically paid for themselves. One of them actually sank at Swan Island just sitting there um, on delivery, which was bad. But they pay for themselves after a single trip. So they're, they're not quite disposable, but they're close. Um, is that kind of interesting? Um, and really, it's, it, the, the punchline is that this comes down to 
production in its purest sense. It gets to this race between how fast are we building versus how fast are they sinking. Um, and the, the allies win because we just, we could flat out outproduce them. Uh, could have been a little bit of advantage. There's some things we could have done. You know, that, that 1942 period uh, could have gone better because the U.S. initially did not adopt convoys and the British were doing it. So we, we looked kind of badly uh, during that. But it never got out of control. It never got to a point where it looked like the, the Germans were going to win it. Um, in practice, the, the worst it ever got in Britain was there was a period of time in early 1943 where they only had three months supply of food in Great Britain. But if you think about what that means, it means that they, they can go three months without getting a single ship in without running out of food. Now that's a little disconcerting, but it's also not a disaster. You, you never hit zero. So in practice, it was tight, but it never got horrible uh, because we got really good at building stuff. Um, and we also got really good at sinking things. It got to a point where we were actually sinking their U-boats so fast that they lost over 100% of the U-boats. They actually had, we sank more U-boats than they started the year with. Um, so it just, it was that we won that race. And we flat out won that race. And, you know, so we win because of things like SS Linfield victory. We win because we got so much more productive at doing this. Um, I think that puts me right at about my, yeah, right about my time target. So that's good. Um, for those of you who want a little more detail, if you want to, to kind of know a bit more about that, what I would recommend, there's some books out there that you can, can read. Um, the first one I'd suggest is a book by the, the economic historian Richard Overy called Why the Allies Won, and this specifically relates to, to material from his chapter two. Uh, if you want a deeper dive on this, and I will warn you in advance, this one is very much a heavy-duty economics book. Uh, it's Davis and Ingerman's Naval Blockades and Peace and War, Economic History since 1750. It's, it's a great book. I love it. It's one of my favorite books, but it's, it's definitely one of those things that you, you got to be an economist to enjoy it. Um, if you want to read the actual math involved or some of the graphs that I showed, you can read Morrison Kimball's Methods of Operation Research. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Liberty Ships and, and how they got good at that, you can uh, read this article about how much did the Liberty Ship Builders learn. Um, if you want to talk about just that sort of general battle of supply chains, there's a very nice book that came out about a year and a half ago from Philip Payson O'Brien, who's an economic historian at Cambridge, uh, called How the War Was Won. Absolutely great. Uh, and then last but not least, the great granddaddy of them all, uh, if you want to kind of get the nuts and bolts details, the stuff that actually describes, honest to God, what happens, you know, what does it mean to command a convoy in combat? So kind of get that full Greyhound experience. You want to read Samuel A. Morrison's History of U.S. Naval Operations in World War II. Specifically, you want to read volumes 1 and 10. Um, 1 and 10. <laughs> The, the one thing with Morrison is he wrote it before they revealed that we could read their codes, but that's a, but in terms of nuts and bolts of how the actual convoys work, it's, it's great. It's a, a great read. Um, there's a reason I keep it on my desk. So anyway, so with that, I will um, so, yep. so I'll drop out of that and uh, oh, thank you for the clap. Um, so any, any kind of questions out there? This is kind of interesting. I, uh, this is basically a week's worth of uh, topics in economic history in 50 minutes. So we, we did it. So. Yes, you did. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, it seems like people were sending you questions kind of throughout the chat, which is yep. awesome. Um, and I see all the claps and thumbs up now. So <laughs> with that, I think we'll end this pubs and profs. Again, thank you so much, um, Eric, for presenting and taking the time to deliver that to everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And keep an eye out on your emails. Thanks, Lance. Um, yeah. And have a great weekend. It's coming up. <laughs> thank you, Rick.
Uh, yeah, Aaron um, heard a cell phone go off during the lecture. How do you toss it over Zoom? Um, I got a plan. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so, Michaela, it's great to see you too. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Tommy. It's it is really it is so great to I, I can't see everybody, but it, thank you. It's it's great knowing you're all out there. So. Uh, oh yeah. So, David, uh, can you give us a copy of the slide deck? Just shoot me an email. And I can, uh, for those who want, come that. Can't wait to look at some of the math. Justine, I know you've been to your first year of grad school. You probably definitely want the math. Um, Jenna, no math. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Math is good. <laughs> Sahaj, I'm saying safe. You stay safe too. 